Hi there, this is my commentary on chapter 22 of Lila and in Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Persig. Where the physical climate changes suddenly from high temperature to low temperature, or from high atmospheric pressure to low atmospheric pressure, the result is usually a storm. When the social climate changes from preposterous social restraint of all intellect to a relative abandonment of all social patterns, the result is a hurricane of social forces. That hurricane is the history of the 20th century. There had been other comparable times, the day Socrates died to establish the independence of intellectual patterns from their social origins, or the day Descartes decided to start with himself as an ultimate source of reality. These were days of evolutionary transformation, and like most days of transformation, no one at the time had any idea of what was being transformed. So that's sort of uh, reminiscent of the Brujo section earlier in the book where you have the Zuni misfit who actually transforms Zuni society. And Persig is talking about high quality static pattern altering shifts. The biggest shifts obviously are from one level to the next. And within levels though are long stretches of time where patterns hold and patterns vanish. And then there is something that twists it, that, that ratchets, it up, ratchets it up We've talked about this in the book, to the next level. This social intellectual jockeying for power has been going on since ancient Greece, and he's gonna, and that's why he mentioned Socrates. That's the beginning of that. Um, sounds like a long time, but you know, 2,000 years is a relatively short period of time in human history. And we are suffering from this um, back and forth today, and we'll talk a little bit about that too in this chapter. So anyway, um, these are these are altering pattern altering shifts and like pressure mediation the shift builds and builds and then something gives and then when the margins this is um, kind of another way analogy this is I think reminiscent of Pajot when the margins move to the center that feeling is of insanity because you've had this thing that's held up for so long and then all this stuff is happening and then that whoosh like pressure mediation becomes the center the absolute mechanical um, horror of the first world war seemed completely and utterly insane and this is something that just floored a Victorian society, and it was. And an antidote for insanity, of course, is rationality, intelligence, uh, and intellectual solutions. So President Woodrow Wilson declared this beginning of intellect over society, at least in the iteration we're seeing. And this probably is the most profound iteration because it involves technology to su such a large degree. So Wilson was saying, enough is enough. We're not going to have any more of this. We're not going to have any kind of more wars like this fought with machines that result in just such carnage. We need to logically figure out how to stop war. And the emotionality of tribalism causes war, and the social level has that tribal emotionality. So what happens then is that it is sort of emerges in society, um, and, and Wilson is the figurehead. And, and primarily, you know, person is talking about Western and, and, and really concentrating on American society. So what happens in American society is the intellectuals who were once the servants of the industrial leaders of society uh, now become the now become leader become leaders over society. So I like some of these concise paragraphs, um, and and this next one really pinpoints that shift in technology together with the focus that is needed to run it. And that focus is really only in, in the intellectual realm. In technology now, rather than... Let, let's look at technologies in the past and use that word psychotechnology from John Verveke. Psychotechnologies are ways of overcoming biology and it's when biology and social um, uh, consensus... The, the psychotechnologies emerge with, of course, the, you know, the, the expanded uh, brain capacity of humans, which is the beginning of intellect. So psychotechnologies evolve and, they, and, and that, that unites um, the social and this burgeoning intellectual over biological. But the new technology is purely intellectual in the sense that 
it has a plan, an objective plan, and it uses that objective plan, um, and we're going to talk about objectivity too, that it uses that objective plan to make things out of organic um, or inorganic material. So here's, here's the paragraph. The mastery of all these new changes was no longer dominated by social skills. It required a technology trained, a technologically trained analytical mind. A horse could be mastered if your resolve was firm, your disposition pleasant, and fear absent. The skills required were biological and social, but handling the new technology was something different. Personal, biological, and social qualities didn't make any difference to machines. And so you've got these virtues, the, these Victorian virtues that pair with technology, horseback riding, like, you know, um, this, this, this lack of fear. They're, they're kind of they're reminiscent of arete virtues, actually, to some extent, which is interesting. So here's another paragraph that describes what happens to, a, to, to really strong patterns when they're breaking down. They fragment and they regress. So in the 20s, people's social life consisted of freely experimenting with a lot of different social and biological value, something they were unable to do under the Victorian mindset. And this is exactly what the Victorians kept at bay. They, this is exactly what they didn't want is what happened in the 20s. This sort of repeats in the 60s, but in the 60s you've got another element, which is, which is um, the hippies are rejecting social values, but they're also rejecting intellectual values. And they're kind of going back in, in this weird dynamic biological space, but that's, a, that's, that's slightly different. But it, but it does, you know, it does kind of, highlight that you're going to get a lot of chaos when the patterns are breaking down. In the chaos of social patterns, a wild new intellectual experimentation could now take place. Abstract art, discordant music, Freudian psychoanalysis, the Sacco Vanzetti trial, contempt for alcoholic prohibition. Literature emphasized the struggle of the noble, free-thinking individual against the crushing opposition of evil social conformity. That's, so there's another thing you're seeing is the emergence of the primacy of the individual in, a, in the modern way. Um, we are seeing a lot of this identity stuff has its basis in that. And we're going to also see, it's, 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 it's interesting coming up here, um, a lot of the basis of what's happening now and in many ways in this chapter. And what starts to happen at the beginnings of what we know um, today until recently, this, this, this crushing opposition of evil social conformity. And now there's a shift occurring again in the great patterns. Our institutions are beginning to break down. And that means government, um, education, educational systems, university, science, these are beginning to fragment because the so-called objective rationality that we've implemented for so long and which the uh, rise of the intellectual, the universities, etc., cetera, um, can no longer sustain the, the ongoing fragment, fragmentation of ideas Technology is, is kind of, uh, technology is replacing our intellect in the sense that it is way more rational and analytical than we are. And so it's creating all sorts of new categories. And our institutions cannot contain this. So if something else is happening now, um, I, uh, I don't know, what, per person was alive when the internet, he, he died in 2015, I think. So he probably had a taste of this. Um, I don't know if he wrote much on it. I, I'd probably have to do a little bit more exploration, but I, I wonder what he'd think if he saw what was happening now. And we don't know where this is going. It could be a disaster. I mean, a lot of people say that this is a harbinger of disaster, all this, all this stuff going on, all this chaos. But it could also be a boon. It could also be a restructuring as to how we are used by technology or we use technology and maybe a lot of persons you know persons understanding of technology about infusing quality into technology is really worth looking at right now so uh, a lot of the stuff that's over in ends in the art of motorcycle maintenance in terms of the patterns the patterns themselves don't really care about us they're going to vacillate and the trouble is you know, we might get caught in a pretty rough vacillation, and that rough patch might be a significant part of a human life. I mean, just consider 
the, the pattern of, of, of communism in, in um, Russia. That was 70 years. So, you know, you live and die in that social, in that, in that low quality social pattern. You see it in China now, you have like a pathological admixture of both communism, the worst of communism and the worst of capitalism. And that kind of um, hundred year thinking, you know, that this, this pattern, they're looking at this pattern lasting many human lives. I remember seeing this cartoon where the earth shook people off like fleas once, once uh, she got sick of you know, them messing around with her. At any rate, the whole thing, again, we're talking about um, that science and objectivity enter the top of the hierarchy of influence. And we're in the dying throes of this era, era where it's going to be impossible to determine where this goes. So this is why, again, quality makes such a difference. Quality, that intuitive thing that we all know, if we can get, if we can just, you know, um, if we can just push away our traps, is a beacon through all this swirling chaos as this huge intellectual, objective, fact-based situation we're in starts to decay. And let's, there's a paragraph here about um, pertaining to the metaphysics of quality and um, Fidrus's adventure. Now the metaphysics of quality had come a long way from his days of frustrated reading about anthropology in the mountains of Montana. He saw that during the early decades of the century, anthropology's unassailable Olympian objectivity had some very partisan cultural roots of its own. He had been a politic it had been a political tool which this is really interesting. It had been a political tool in with which to defeat the Victorians and their system of social values. He doubted whether there was another field anywhere within the academic spectrum that so clearly revealed the gulf between the Victorians and the new twentieth century intellectuals. So look at what's happening and why we're having a divide and why power is being bandied about as a big problem. Power is not necessarily um, something, if you had a quality point of view, you're going to want what's best. You're not going to want to dominate. Some, sometimes dominating is best. That's a whole different thing. But power itself, power, you know, isolated power itself is a tool, is a political tool to keep your patterns intact and not let them be infected or infiltrated by other patterns. The problem is those if you if you don't have dynamism and integration with the two patterns, which is the way things should go, which is the way things evolve, you you have this this force that keeps the other pattern at bay, and so then you have a you have this, and this is what we see right now. Victorians have a value system that that begins to value money, and it has to be because aristocracy does not exist in the United States. The Victorians came from Europe, but they didn't come over as, as um, originally as aristocrats, obviously. Some of, the, some of them were peasants, some of them were even criminals. The Victorian and the, you know, this, this dynamic um, situation in the United States allows for industriousness, and this industrious gives them money, and subsequently the, what the aristocracy enjoys, which is freedom. Naturally, with the spending power, a new aristocracy, a new hierarchy is, is established in the United States. So one thing that's really interesting about this chapter is it discusses the origin of cultural relativism. And, um, and we're using anthropology uh, because of the reasons he gave us to, to, um, to trace this. And I just want to say something real quick um, about the intellectual level and intellect itself as we know it today. In the Genealogy of Morals um, by Nietzsche, he says that the priest class, you know, the priests, um, the intellectuals developed because unlike the warrior, let's say the warrior, the warrior who valued arete, um, the, there is this other section of people who are weaker and therefore they can't manifest their energy externally so they turn that energy inward and all that machination on the inside creates something like this widening chasm uh, kind of like you know inputting data and then that data creates this 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 
piece, this part in this priest class that becomes something like the intellect of, um, of course, it's, it's going to be theologian, um, uh, religious figures, but that is where intellect lived for a long time. It certainly lived there throughout the Middle Ages. And this is where intellect comes from. So the priests became a force to be reckoned with, with these powerful physical warriors, uh, because intellect is a very powerful tool. And ultimately, as we've seen in the 20th century, more powerful than physical, than, than physical prowess. So the same kind of thing happens when the intellectuals surpass the Victorians. They're more adept at dealing with technology. But still, there's conflict, and cultural relativism emerges out of objective anthropology, which is a counter to imperialism. The Victorians believed in that primitive societies were just that. They were primitive societies, and with, you know, with, with God's, and they're doing God's work, they're doing a favor to these primitive people by speeding up the process. Therefore, imperialism and dominating all these primitive cultures is justified. And the intellectuals are trying to counter the Victorians. So how do you counter the Victorians best? You do, it the, you, you do the opposite. You decide with this scientific objectivity that you're applying this to mankind too. And that each culture, they're not primitive, they just have their own set of value and morals, and that these values have merit. And this is the doctrine that spreads. So this is the origin of cultural relativism, and this is, of course, the origins of the other things we're looking at today, postmodernism, a lot of this um, fighting we're having over identity. That This is the origin of it. It's where the intellectuals use this mechanism to defeat the Victorians. So there's a few more passages I want to read. The, that victory is always presented as a victory of scientific objectivity over unscientific prejudice, but the metaphysics of quality says deeper issues were involved, the conflict between society and intellect. And that's much better, of course, metaphysics of quality is always a better lens to look at these things through because you see the actual patterns and the kind of, the type of, you know, these, you see the underlying structure of what's happening and you can make much more sense of it and if you're involved say in the culture wars and you see it through metaphysics of quality then you're very likely not to be in one particular camp the new cultural relativism became popular because it was a ferocious instrument for the dominance of intellect over society intellect could now pass judgment on all forms of social custom including victorian custom but society could no longer pass judgment on intellect that put intellect clearly in the driver's seat. When people asked, if no culture, including a Victorian culture, can say what is right and what is wrong, then how will you ever know what's right and, and what is right and what is wrong? The answer was, that's easy. Intellectuals will tell you. And of course, they're going to frame themselves as being better prepared to tell you because they have this superior scientific objectivity. And it's that objectivity that can look at everything and come up with new morals. So even though in the metaphysics of quality, the intellectual level is the highest level. It's the most moral level. You know, be careful when, with, with these things I'm saying. You, you, have to, you have to understand metaphysics of quality isn't a, a one-off type thing. Even though it's at the top moral level um, and they're right, these intellectuals are also wrong because they are becoming too rigid. They are lacking dynamism. They are, they are completely committed to objectivity. And so val there's no place for value in the system. And that's showing up now how our rationali rationality isn't working well anymore because we don't have a cohesive uh, set of morals and we don't agree on what's good. And that is very obvious. And now with technology, a lot of the reasons that our institutions are breaking down is, is again, we can't keep up with it. It's becoming too sophisticated, too fast. We simply have not evolved to handle it, and it's forcing us to handle it nonetheless. So trying to analyze what's going on with all these bits and bobs of information everywhere constantly exploding, um, trying to analyze them and and pair them against each other and, and make make con conceptual fra concepts concepts out of them isn't isn't near enough anymore. It's combinatorially explosive. We can't keep up with it. We have to figure out a, to, a way to make sense of it as a whole. 
And this is why, again, this metaphysical frame could be really useful to see what's happening. And then when we see patterns that are harmonious, those are high quality patterns rather than fracturous. And if we can, you know, once again, get a handle on quality, on real quality, on that intuitive understanding that we have underneath all these intellectual ideas, if we can reintegrate some stuff from the past, not go back to the past, but reintegrate that wisdom from the past, we may be way better off because we can't weigh the facts anymore because we don't even know what the facts are, really. From the perspective of a subject-object science, the world is a completely purposeless, valueless place. There is no point in anything. Nothing is right and nothing is wrong. Everything just functions like machinery. There is nothing morally wrong with being lazy, nothing morally wrong with lying, with theft, with suicide, with murder, with genocide. There is nothing morally wrong because there are no morals, just functions. That again. So the Victorians have this idea that is that everything is kind of a rough version of themselves, that they are the chosen people, and they're here to refine other cultures and the landscape and the cities into a moral goal, and, they, and, and, and children, and they do this with strictness and with force. The intellects, again, countering the Victorians, motivatedly counting the Victorians, they go for society itself and start using the rational life on those very Victorian patterns. The Victorians said that the ills of the world are because of sin. Intellectuals say, okay, let's find these social patterns that are causing this sin. And so they begin to dismantle these social patterns that are causing sin. The patterns are dismantled now, and so again they have to make up morals. And, and how they end up making up American morals, which may not be a bad thing, is they, knowing or not knowing this, it comes from the Indians because you've got this new objective anthropology that, that reveres primitive culture and you have this counter to the Victorians and it ends up that they also counter the Victorians, uh, revere the simple man, the man of the land. Those men of the land in America were these, these early immigrants who had to integrate with Indian culture in order to survive. So they took on, as, as was um, explained earlier in this book, they took on Indian way of understanding. And that is the, the native way of understanding this country. So... Again, these two views still exist in politics, and we're not again. Let me introduce this idea that these two uh, views exist in politics. It's very obvious. You have the intellectual elite and the university professors and the politicians and the uh, Google and, and, and Facebook and all that stuff, and they are retaining that into that, that superiority that they know what's good for society. They dominate society. And then you have this socially oriented working class who want to protect marriage, family values, everything else. Left and right, obviously. And it's this conflict between this level. Persick said this is still going on, but it's gotten really bad. Now it's very, very divided. So Persig remarks upon this badness that he sees happening. And he thinks that a large part of it is because the intellectual level is trying to take these theoretical notions and lay them on top of society without any benefit of understanding societal patterns, you know, quash society with these intellectual ideas that sound so good on paper. Of course, the intellectuals don't seem to understand that continuing to, to um, enforce these top-down ideas is usually going to result in low quality because intellectual preconceived notions of what society should be versus a bottom-up evolution of what society is are two different things. So let's look at an example of this in, in, in the news. So the left thinks it can solve racism by making white people feel bad about everything they, you know, that their ancestors did in the past. And therefore, by doing this, we will be transformed into... Um, a group, you know, 
since we have the reins on power, we will open up the, uh, our, our, our institutions and be more welcoming of the George Floyds of this world and open up opportunities to them. But what really ends up happening is something that doesn't help the George Floyds at all. What ends up happening is a bunch of upper middle class people, uh, white and, and otherwise, who are in this class because this class is very, very uh, rich with, with um, black and brown people. The upper middle class gets together and in rooms and in office, you know, in office diversity trainings, they get, they have these struggle sessions with each other and they out virtue each other and they're very dis dishonest about what, what they're really thinking. And so the people implementing these ideas, and we know who they are, these people get rich. And meanwhile, the people that were, you know, presumably were, were supposed to be helping the George Floyds of this world continue to go down the road of perdition because they have no real, real support to subvert that. They, the institutions, whatever kinds of policies we've been trying to implement aren't working. These, these top-down policies that aren't really listening to the people at all and not, you know, deciding what's best for them. It's, it's outrageous. This is, this is the message, in fact, of this great book I read, Invisible Man, uh, by Ralph Ellison. Because acting out this theoretical doesn't actually support low-income black people. And for good measure, let's look at something else. Let's look at the opposite of this. Let's look at the low quality of holding on too tight to social patterns. So the right, for a very long time, was almost unanimously opposed to gay marriage. And they were desperate to hold on to what they believed to be the God-given purpose of that very, very high quality social pattern. But the gay community was evolving from the bottom up and becoming stronger. And society finally recognized, through a lot of you know, uh, a lot of work on the, on, on the part of the gay community. It was a magnificent venture. That love and commitment between two people were the same, no matter who they were. And this very old social pattern naturally evolved and updated to include everyone. But in this chapter, um, we're, we're talking a lot about these enforcing these top-down theories on society. It can't work. The social the way that the gay community did it was it was taking these ideas of equality from the intellectual level and the actuality of their own um, culture and the two were integrating they met halfway and that's why it worked that's also why civil rights worked because you had some people like Martin Luther King and other activists from that community um, taking these theological and you know, intellectually theological and intellectual ideas, and very good social patterns, by the way, of religion, and integrating the two, so you had um, so equality actually played out in reality. So, Phaedrus just wants things to be better. And here's his observation. And tell me if this isn't <laughs> the perfect description of the meaning crisis. Everyone seemed to be guided by an objective scientific view of life that told each person that his essential self is his evolved material body. Ideas and societies are a component of brains, not the other way around. No two brains can merge physically, and therefore no two people can ever really communicate, except in a mode of ships, radio operators, sending messages back and forth in the night. A scientific intellectual culture had become a culture of millions of isolated people living and dying in little cells, psychic solitary confinement, boy is that right, unable to talk to one another really, and unable to judge one another because scientifically speaking it's impossible to do so. Each individual in his cell of isolation was told that no matter how hard he tried, no matter how hard he worked, his whole life is that of an animal that lives and dies like any other animal. He could invent moral goals for himself, but they are just artificial inventions. Scientifically speaking, he has no goals. Wow. That is the meaning crisis. These little cells we live in, these more, the, we have no cohesiveness. We have no moral goals that we can, that we can agree upon that the, the social level, the main pattern of the social level was religion. And we all came under, you know, one nation under God is how we were founded. And that has fragmented disastrously. So, so in, this, in this meaning crisis, man can invent meaning for himself through preconceived notions and distractions. But again, none of this is naturally evolved. 
This is all in one's brain, like he was saying. And perhaps the worst elements of this, or one of the worst elements is this, is how far we are removed from nature. We don't understand nature. Yes, we have conquered nature with science, but when it pops its head through, we can feel pretty lost, like this pandemic. On top of which, oh, and, and you know, you, during this pandemic, you know, not being connected to nature, we were relatively unhealthy in this country. And this really knocked off the people who have been, <laughs> whose diet, let's just say, originated in the lab, originated in the intellect. So the people that this really got were people who, you know, live on this, this, uh, gene this manufactured food. And so we were ill-prepared physically. We're so far from nature to deal with it. That's one thing. Another thing is we relied on science to help us. And in, in the net positive it has, you know, at least in this country. Then in the net positive, we've done a good job conquering the pandemic, but in a really weird way. Because even science is so conflicted now. And in a lot of ways, science has lost credibility during this pandemic. It's no longer guiding us to this presumptive utopia that the objectivity of science promised. Its fatal flaw, this presumption of objectivity, has been so laid bare because in this pandemic, it wasn't science, but the most convenient science for the narrative that was chosen and all other censored. So, in a, so what science is, yeah, it gave us the vaccine, but it, it prevented us, it forbid us to look at anything else, maybe, more, maybe things that were more related to nature, or maybe things that are a little bit more established that have been around. No, it had to be just this, and any sci scientist who didn't agree with this was a quack, and that is not true at all. So in a value, so say we had a value-based understanding, what we would want was what would be best, and so all scientific inquiry would have been considered and we would have, you know, weighed the pros and cons. But what happened in this situation is we picked what we wanted or the, the forces that be picked what they wanted and they pushed everything else to the side. And this is coming to the surface. <laughs> so in a world of the intellectual primacy breaking down at the end of the utility of pure reason, now we see this force. We see that the powers that be are protecting what they want to protect. And science is not, you know, science has been prevented from evolving the way it should. And that definitely indicates the breakdown of, uh, of the, intellectual as, the intellectual level as it is. They were living in some kind of movie projected by this intellectual electromechanical machine that had been created for their happiness, saying, paradise. Paradise, paradise, but which had inadvertently shut them out from direct experience of life itself and from each other. So I hope that makes sense, and I'll see you next time.